Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Um, may I call Mrs Palmer, please? Yes, of course. I do solemnly, I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Could you confirm your full name, please? Yeah, Rita Ann Palmer. Um, and do you have a copy of your witness statement in front yes, of you? Yes, I do. And um, for the transcript, that is WITN 0530100. And if you look, if we bring up page 13 of that document, please. Yep. Yes. Um, is that your signature there? Yes, it is. Um, have you read through this statement recently? Yes, I have. And is it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Um, that statement is in evidence. Everything I ask you now is supplementary. Um, and thank you very much for preparing that witness statement and for coming to give evidence thank here you. today. Um, starting with your background, what was your background before you started working for the post office? I um, went to college and did a private secretary certificate. And then I went to work for the local council um, as, in a, as a secretary typing pool. Um, and then I did a short spell with the Wells Conservative, working for the local Conservative MP, as is um, PA. And then I moved to the post office. And your first job at post office counters was as a counter clerk? Is that yes, right? it was, yes. Um, and can you tell us a bit about that? Um, well, I did six weeks um, training, classroom and um, being observed on the counter um, at a local branch office and then went on to the counter and I did altogether about 17 years in Wells Post Office which was my local branch. Um, I worked on the counter um, and then I also did, um, I covered for the sub postmaster, well he was a postmaster then because we had the sorting office attached to the back so the postmaster looked after the postman and the counter at that time so it was all one business. Um, so I did some um, cover for his leave and things as well. And I also did um, some relief work. Um, we had a floating reserve that would go around different Crown branch offices when they needed um, cover. So I went to, worked in Bath and Shepton and Street and different branch offices. Did you enjoy those jobs? I loved it, yeah. Um, and what was the accounting system like at that time? It was manual. It was um, a pencil and a rubber. We had a daily book to put all the figures in, which had to be transferred over to a weekly book and reconciled. And, um, yeah, it was a paper, a pencil and a rubber and a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. You then became a trainer in 1997, is yeah. that right? Yes. Why did you want to become a trainer? I think... I'd been on the counter then for about 17 years, and I think I'd... I'd I didn't really want to go into um, manager. I tried, I'd done it as relief, but I didn't really enjoy it. And then there was um, a vacancy for a, a trainer in the Bristol area. And I just, I, I loved the job. I loved working in the post office. I liked the customers, I liked the transactions, and I liked the achievement you got every week by doing a balance and proving that you'd done all your work correctly and everything. So I enjoyed that bit of it, and I just thought, I, wanted to help somebody else do it and it was um, an opportunity and I took advantage of it and I enjoyed it. And then between 1997 and 2012 you had various roles within training. Yes. Um, you were a trainer, training manager, audit and training manager, is that right? Yes, yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about those various different roles and what they involved? Yeah, the, I started off initially as a trainer and um, based with that I was um, supporting new sub postmasters when they bought a post office um, I would attend their branch to help them um, understand the transactions and how to um, serve customers, how to process the transactions, um, all the paperwork side of it and their accounting and everything. And then um, I did that for... And I, I can't recall the dates. I'm, I'm not very good with dates, so I can't recall them really. But I did that for quite a length of time. Um, and then I... I think the process then was I, I went on to manage the team. So I managed a team of trainers um, in the southwest because I'm from the southwest, down as far as Cornwall, Somerset, Devon, 
Um, I also managed um, the team at a different time for South Wales, so down as far as Carmarthen and so Swansea, Cardiff and that area. And I also managed a team of um, trainers in the central part of um, the south, so sort of like the M4, M5 corridor down, so Southampton, Portsmouth, around that way. At different times I managed those teams. And then um, there was another... Re Post off, well, there was lots of reorganisations. I had to apply for my job on several occasions, reapply for it with the di different reorganisations. Um, and then I, um, when they amalgamated the training and the audits together, multi skill in the team, I managed a team of um, trainer auditors then as well. How did you find being in that management position? I, um, I enjoyed it. They were they were they were really good people to work with. The teams were, I I think anybody that um, all the trainers and auditors that I've come across um, in the times I managed them, they always worked so hard and put themselves out. Um, they wanted to do the best they could for the people that they were working with, and work for each other. So I really enjoyed that side of it. I think the only thing was that my. My favourite role was the training bit and the face-to-face -face with customers and working and with the sub-postmaster. So that is obviously any job when you sort of like move up and you move away from the practical bits of it, it changes. Can you tell us a bit about the background of trainers that you managed? What kind of backgrounds did they come from? What were they like? They, um, all different backgrounds basically. Um, and I think the one thing that sort of like they all had was a motivation to support and do the best they could for the person they were training and you know the hours we worked the distances we traveled and even when sort of like you weren't feeling 100 percent they would still be there because they didn't want to let people down in 2012 you moved to a field change advisor role is that right yes and what did that involve that was when they uh, started the rollout of the network transformation program. So that was um, visiting sub postmasters and post offices to um, discuss the benefits of changing to the new models because the two new models they were bringing out was the um, local model and the main model. So it was uh, sitting down and having conversations with sub postmasters. And then once they'd agreed to um, change over to the new model, it was following that process through. So making sure, sort of like, taking them on that journey where they, um, their office would be having new counters installed and um, right the way through the process. You then left the post office in September 2016, is that yeah. right? Um, what was the post office culture like when you joined? <laughs> I said, when I joined, um, it was just a... Um, a step away from the um, civil service sort of like mentality in that um, I suppose the job we did then the customer wasn't as much of the focus as doing the work and doing the transactions and the balancing and that sort of side of it where and you know as the post office has become more um, more retail focused on things and the, the government transactions have reduced and we've got to look for new transactions it's gone away from that sort of thing where just for an example really when when I worked on the counter it was the days when there were separate queues and if I was going for my lunch hour I would close and my queue would have to move to somebody else whereas they generally changed after the, you know going forward it changed so the focus was on the customer so you know you won't leave the counter until the queue's gone Back in those days, it was very regimented and very sort of like um, I said, it's like if you had a tea break for 15 minutes, you'd have a tea break for 15 minutes. As those to doing training and things like that, you didn't have tea breaks, you didn't have lunch breaks. If your sub postmaster had customers and you were in a, a post office and there was people waiting, they got served. So it it, it was quite a change of um, culture, really. I think. Um, so when you left, it was much more customer focused as opposed to when you joined some years earlier. Definitely, because the the reduction in um, the government transactions and the processes, we would lose, we've lost, you know, sort of like child benefits and TV licenses and all that sort of the, those products. So, you know, a lot of part of the local and main models was looking at the retail side as well, which is part of some of the 
job I did when a field change advisor was um, under NT between 2012 and 2016, was also helping sub postmasters with their retail side as well, because that was getting as in, that was more important to fill up <coughs> some more income for them because of the reduction in the post office transactions and products. Um, turning back to when you started as a trainer, before Horizon was introduced, what was the training like? What did it involve? I, I can't really recall because it changed so many times, the actual length and stuff, but I, I think I remember that it was probably about two weeks with a sub-postmaster and then you would go back the following two Wednesdays to help them do their accounts as well. Just to, they needed some time to sort of like do bits on their own as well because um, it's they loved you having being there and holding their hand right the way through when they started because they didn't know what they were doing but you had to give them some time to sort of like do things on their own but then going back on the Wednesday to do the balance with them then you could fill in any gaps or any questions and stuff and help them through that process as well so I think it was two weeks and two full up balances initially but that was going back to sort of like 2000 and 2008, 2000, well, quite early anyway. Um, if we could turn up your witness statement, um, paragraph five, that's W-I-T-N. Yep, we, there it is. And if we could go over the page. Um, looking at paragraph five, you say there, when the Horizon system was introduced, I'm unsure of the dates, I completed my initial training on a one-week course in Leeds before the system was rolled out to the whole network. I had some computer knowledge as I'd done some evening classes at Stride College to gain qualifications in Word, Excel and PowerPoint. I had no previous knowledge of the Horizon system until this training. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate bit or a bit more on what that training was like when Horizon first came in? I can't really recall the actual training as such, but I know it's um, the actual system was completely different from any sort of computers and things as well, because it was purpose built for that. And um, it was a case of sort of like going, being shown all through all the processes through the um, different um, screens and things like that and getting used to it. And I know they also um, covered doing reversals and, um, you know, transaction corrections and balancing as well. But I can't, I can't remember any, any more detail than that about the course. Did you feel like it was a lot to take in at the time? I think, personally, I think because I had the knowledge of the transactions and the understanding of the background, it was, it was basically sort of, like, um, sort of like putting them onto a computer and things. So that helped. I think it was much harder for somebody who didn't understand a transaction in its paper form and then trying to put it on there. You mentioned training on balancing. Um, how easy did you find that? Um, compared to the manual balancing, when you're doing a when you were doing a manual balance, it was very easy to um, transpose figures or put things wrong, write things down wrong, or add things up wrong. So it took all that bit away from it. So you had actually basically a list of um, what stock should be there, and you just ticked it off. So in that way, it was easier. Um, there were different reports that had to be completed to get to that balancing process. And that was the bits that took time. But there were um, handouts and sort of like eight work aids to show you each process. So if you followed them step by step, you could have done it if you didn't know, if you didn't understand have any background at all. But it was just following it slowly step by step without any interruptions and things. Did you feel like you were well prepared after that training to go and train sub-postmasters? I think... Um, Probably as, pre as prepared as I could have been. I wasn't unconfident, but it's like anything. When you're shown first, you need to get out there and see how it works in the real world and actually do it that way. And then, you know, it's from there that you build up your, um, your experience and your knowledge. You would have been one of the first people to deliver training. Would that have been right? One of the initial kind of cohorts training on Horizon? Well, before me would have been, the, when they rolled out Horizon, there were um, Horizon support officers, so they actually did all the, um, most of the initial training. But you would have been, straight after that, one of the first groups of people training sub-postmasters yeah. after that? Yes, it would have been. Um, how did you find the sub-postmasters that you were training? What, what was their perception of Horizon like at that time? I think it, depend, it did depend on the individual. Um, some sort of like we're looking forward to it, getting rid of the 
paper and the pens and all the books and the paperwork because the it was supposed to get rid of a lot of the paperwork side of it um, so for those people they were happy to look at it that way um, some of the sub postmasters hadn't um, especially sort of and I, I'm not being ageist here but some of the older people hadn't been used to using a computer or a keyboard so they were starting from sort of like a really um, concerned area they didn't want to put things on there and they you know they were scared of it really but it, so it's just putting people at ease and showing them how it worked can you tell us a bit about the classroom training element from um when was horizon was in yes it, when horizon was now we're talking about when yeah it was yeah introduced. um yeah the classroom we had um training um kits so you had it was set up um so you had like sort of like most of the classrooms as far as i remember were six um work unit so they would have them um, the horizon um keyboard the terminal and the printer and everything on there um and we also had um dummy transactions and dummy stock and cash and things so basically over um the period of training we'd start them off some we covered sort of like um basic sort of like um customer care and that sort of side of it as well as well as some sales but to do the transactions we would give them dummy transactions and show them how to process it on horizon so they were getting used to the keyboard and getting used to the screens and then those transactions we'd use those and perform um some balances as well to get them to use to get them to have a um, at least go through the system and stuff as well so we would use practical materials and we would also use um, give them handouts and things as well to take back to their office when they go live. So they had those to refer to. And then can you tell us about on-site training? On-site training, um, generally they'd been to, some had been to a classroom, so had a little bit of knowledge. Some sub-postmasters had some knowledge because they'd have previous offices, but some were coming in um, without any experience at all. So... It was very much um, starting from scratch, really, for some of them. And it was, um, if they'd been to the classroom, it was all right because they, at least they, they'd seen the system and stuff. So doing it from scratch was really difficult. So classroom before was really important. But on-site training, um, as, as I didn't think I was, I thought I was quite a good trainer. I, I, in my way of doing it, I stayed back and they had to do it. <coughs> I can remember one sub-postmaster who said, you do the first couple of hours and I'll watch. I said, no, that's not how it works. You do it and I'll stand back. And, and it took, takes a long time and um, they're under pressure because there's a queue of customers as well. But generally, um, I always found that the customers were quite respectful and patient because they were appreciated they were having a new sub-postmaster. They appreciated the post office was still staying and they would be patient with that person. So, you know, it was... Um, it was different. Everybody learns differently, and everybody takes a little more. Some just some were quick and pick things up, and some people are slower. But did you feel that you had enough time to train sub postmasters? Um, in time, it depends how the time was used, because. Um, Sometimes you would go to an office and the new sub-postmaster, although you made it clear that you needed them, if, they were there, if I was going to be there for two weeks, I needed them to focus on the post office bit for that two weeks. But obviously with um, taking over a post office and a retail, um, reps are coming in, they know the office has changed, they'll be coming in, and so they would disappear and, you know, you'd be stood there behind the counter especially when there was moment the customers were queuing up that was fine because you could keep them focused but sometimes they would disappear and go and um, talk to the card rep or the cigarette rep and stuff as well not realizing that's important time that they needed so yeah there, there, there was never enough time and from the postmaster's point of view they would have been they would have loved us to stay there for a month <laughs> you know and hold their hand but it just practically it wouldn't work so in for the majority of cases that was it was enough time and if it wasn't then we could flag for um, extra support if somebody was really struggling how often did you refer people for extra support I can't recall but I wouldn't have said very many times um, and at one point you've mentioned this already the training and auditing functions were combined in around yeah. 2008 we could turn up your statement, please. Again, it's WITN 0536010. And 
And if we could turn to page three, please. Um, and if we pick it up, it says, personally, for Lionstein, I didn't feel that the roles of trainer and auditor were appropriate to combine. There are different skill sets required to train people to adapt to different learning styles, whilst completing an audit is more process-driven and people's skills are not so crucial. Some of the auditors were uncomfortable delivering training, and likewise some training <coughs> trainers were not comfortable completing audits. It was a job rule change that was a business decision that we had to implement, but I did not feel it was a change for the better. Can you tell us a bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah, and I mean, I understand the business um, wanting to multi-skill people because it's a better, a better use of resource, especially when you're covering a whole country and you've got 17,000 or 11,000 post offices. So, you know, for the needs for the business, it um, makes it more sensible. But personally, um, some of the... I was, a, I was a manager then, so I, had to, I supported some of the auditors through um, learning, train, learning how to train, and I supported some of the trainers learning how to audit. And for some of them, yes, they could adapt from one to the other. It came naturally. But for some of them, it wasn't, it wasn't, an, easy, it wasn't an easy move and it wasn't comfortable because um, the people skills for training and actually keeping back and letting people learn in their own way is different from going in and filling in, um, I, I, I don't want to take it away from an auditor, but sort of like completing spreadsheets and um, figure work and things like that. So I, I still felt it was um, two different skills, which some people, and I mean, one of my auditors, um, when he did classroom training, was absolutely fantastic. It's something he would never have tried and never have done. So some people developed really well. But some of them, it was um, they had to do it because that was the job role, and they take it on board and they adapted. But it didn't necessarily mean they were happy and comfortable doing it. Did you think it was appropriate that the same people were training as conducting audits? I don't. Th I don't think it was inappropriate. I think you can you can do both because you're not doing it at the same time. And um, some of it, um, I think I can remember that we did sort of like we would do a transfer audit and then stay there and do the training. So, you, you know, so there was there was times when it did work. So did you know people who audited people that they trained? Uh, I can't I can't recall anybody that. And did needing to carry out audits impact on how you saw sub postmasters if you were training them, but also auditing them? Um, I don't. I don't feel it did for me. I don't think it made any difference to me. To your colleagues? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I can't speak for them, but I, I don't think it would have done because it was like, you know, whatever role you were going in there to do, that was what that was what you did. Um, you attended courses during your time um, to upskill. Um, can you tell us a bit about the courses you attended while you were a trainer to upskill yourself? Yeah, I, I can't recall the specific ones, but I know I did things like sort of like learning styles and um, um, then we did different courses on new products and stuff like that sort of thing. But there was it was, it was sort of like the there was development there if you, you know, that was available and you could put yourself forward for different courses as well. So. There was never anything like sub postmasters are struggling with balancing. Let's do a top up course on balancing for trainers or responding to issues like that. Not at that time, no. I mean, I think anything that um, I thought as a, as a team we were very good at sharing best practice, and if anybody had any um, information to um, share, then we would share. Um. If we could turn up NFSP uh, 50261. And if we could turn to page 7, please. We've looked at this report a number of times in this inquiry. Did you see this at the time? No. Um, if we could turn to page 15, please. Um training um so this was at the beginning of 2000 
it was fine that opinion was split on the training with 50% saying the training was good and 50% saying it was poor. And if we turn over the page to page 16, scrolling down to balancing, um, nearly a fifth of respondents are finding balancing using Horizon very difficult and a further quarter are finding it fairly difficult. Um, I appreciate this would have been before you started carrying out training, um, but did that reflect your experience? Yeah, it probably did. But I think, again, the purpose of um, the feedback and getting that from them is to then improve and develop what training they're getting. Um, and did you feel like you did improve? the training that they were getting? I know there was, um, even in the classroom, we introduced more practical um, examples so they could, um, where we probably were doing maybe one balance in a, in a week, we'd bring in a, um, a two, two balances, Wednesdays and Fridays, just to get them practising going through the system. So there were, there were sort of like um, improvements um, ongoing. If we could take that document down, please, and go back to your statement, um, WITN 05360100. And if we could turn to page 10 of that, please. Um, paragraph 17, scrolling down. Um, you say, um, in paragraph six, 17, um, in the early days, I would leave my phone number, this is the second sentence, in case they got stuck, but this caused problems when I was working at the following post office, so I encouraged them to use the helpline. Um, could you tell us a bit more about why you gave these sub-postmasters your telephone number? I think it, when you'd been with somebody um, for like two weeks and working quite closely with them, um, you had knowledge... Um, part of helping them was to sort of like um, tidy the office up, put things in an order so they could find things and stuff as well. So um, I had knowledge of the actual offices. So if they had a query, sometimes it would have been easier for them to call me and say, how do I do this or where will I find this? Um, than phone the helpline because the helpline hasn't got that local knowledge. So and because you, you build a relationship with people when you're working with them that closely as well. But then, um, because of the nature of the job we were doing, the following two weeks I could be busy somewhere else or not have a signal of things, and you wouldn't want them holding on just to talk to you. So it was to encourage them really to use the helpline or the Horizon Help or whatever support, you know, the NBSC, whatever support was appropriate for whatever query they had. Um, did you ever have someone phone you and say, I just can't do this, I, I can't balance, I don't know what's going on, but I can't... Um, <laughs> I cut, I, the, the, the time I can recall was when I was going for um, a meal with some friends and I was in the back of a car, it was about a 40 minute journey and my sub-postmaster called me and he couldn't balance his lottery so I spent that 40 minute journey talking him through it step by step to get there but we did it and it was, it was fine but yes, if they, sometimes if they got in a pickle it's really difficult was that one of the reasons why you stopped giving your phone number? Were you being... No, it, it wasn't that at all. No, that's not why I stopped doing it. It was, it was mainly because it was, I didn't want to sort of have anybody um, having that delay and getting help when they needed it just because they were waiting for me to answer the phone if I was busy or um, working somewhere else. So, yeah, that wasn't why I stopped it. But <laughs> um, You received feedback throughout your time as a trainer, is that right? Yeah. Um, if we could turn up POL uh, 405850. Um, we heard from Chris Gilding that these were kind of collated feedback forms. If we turn over to page four. Rita Ken Kendellen. Kendellen, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so these are the types of feedback comments that you would have received, is that right? Yeah, they would have been from um, my my team members, my trainers, when they were doing um, obviously the passports and bureau bit. That's about sort of um, the classroom training. So it's 
when they're in the classroom, if they had any feedback, then we would feed it back and I can take it to the review meetings. And so when it says in the right-hand column, no change, these are things that would be flagged to you and you would consider and decide whether or not to take forward to the... Yeah. No, no, this would have been um, after we'd gone to the... We'd meet as the field team leaders, we would meet and then discuss the, um, the feedback and the comments or suggestions from the team and then decide whether it was appropriate to make those changes, if it was possible to make those changes, and then feedback to the team whether it was um, possible or not. Um, if we could turn up POL 30033610. Um, so this is another form of feedback form, isn't it? Yes. Do you recognise this? What, what does this show? Um, basically, the, the, um, the insurance session in the classroom was too long. So obviously, when they're delivering it, um, you're getting a sense then of well, how, how well it works with, sub, with the postmasters in the classroom. So obviously they say it was, the session was too long, so um, split it up and um, try it in a different way. Because trying to, get the, um, trying to get the messages and the knowledge to the delegates, it's, um, if it doesn't work, there's no good just keep trying it in the same way, so we'll try it in a different way. Um, if we could turn over the page, so I think this is still the feedback from your yeah. team, um, yes. and we can see um, in the I think it's the sixth box down. Yeah. Um, it says lose the one month phone call and the PTV at the three month stage and change it to a PTV at one month and PTA at six to nine month stage. Can you tell us um, what's going on in that box? Yeah, it's a post office jargon most of it, but yeah, it's the, um, it's the PTC in the first box is post transfer contact. So there was a process where following the transfer of an office, we would um, keep in contact with the sub postmaster to um, find out how things were going and help if they needed any help. So basically there was a one month phone call um, and a po the PTV is post transfer visit so that would be after three months. But what we were what we're looking at there, I think, is that it would be better to visit after the one month because then you're face to face, and if they've got any issues or they've got any queries, you can actually help to resolve them then. And then after three months, do a um, a call. So this was a suggestion, yeah. and then you evaluate it and decide yes. practically what's best. Yeah. And how often were you doing this kind of exercise? I think it was quarterly, but I couldn't. Um, I don't recall properly, but I think it was quarterly reviews. I think at the time. Um, we previously touched on audits. If we could pull up POL three zeros three 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 nine eight. Um, this is a slideshow of assurance review quality of auditing that was carried out in two thousand and eleven. Um, if we turn to page three. we can see in the introduction that the purpose of this report is to document the findings, conclusions and recommendations in respect of an annual review that sought to independently assure the quality of branch auditing within post office. Um, and if we turn to page six, um, we can see there that chapter four, transfers and conversions, you are down there as the author. I don't think I was the author. I was. Um, that was my chapter that my team would review. Okay. So when it says author Rita Kellendell, Kellendell, sorry, yeah. Kellendell, <laughs> um, that yeah. that would be your team's responsibility. It would. Yeah. It would be. Yes. We had a chapter each to um, review on a regular basis, and then um, then I would feed that back in. Yeah. And can you explain how transfers and conversions fits within this framework of of auditing? From what I remember, well, we did transfer audits. So when an office was transferring to um, another sub-postmaster, then it would be audited by one of our team with the postmaster there. So that all that was collated. And the conversions, I can't, I can't recall that, but that's probably... No, I, I really can't recall that bit, the conversion bit. Um, that document could come down, please. Um... Turning back to your witness statement, if we could uh, bring up WITN 
60100 at page 12, please. Um, looking at the bugs, errors and defects in the Horizon IT system, um, you say I was not aware of any issues or problems with the Horizon system in my time with Post Office Limited. I never heard of any issues from anyone, so there was no impact that I had to deal with. Um, and the same at paragraph 27. Yeah. Is that right? The yes, it is. And to be honest, um, I was told, um, I, I'd had nothing else to... Um, changed my mind on it that the horizon the system was fit for purpose so whenever I did an audit or did training or if I was um, trying to find any errors or anything I was looking for an input error a human error or something else and I had no reason to question that the horizon system was wrong and nobody ever told me any different you never had a sub postmaster saying it's the system it's not me not at all no um, were you aware of a Computer Weekly article in 2009 that raised issues with the Horizon, the, uh, the integrity of the Horizon system? No, not at all. So that wasn't something that was spoken to your knowledge at no, the time? No, no. And if, we'd, if I had thought there was any bugs or things in the system, my approach would, be completely di would have been completely different. How in, that, in that I wouldn't always be looking for the human error and for people putting wrong figures and things in. And yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, it would have been completely different. What about the after the Panorama program in 2015? Do you remember people talking about that while you were still at the post office? Yes, and I, I did watch it. Yeah, were you shocked? Absolutely. Um, what did people you spoke to within the po post office think about it? I can't remember talking to any um, people within the post office, but personally, I felt. I suppose I felt. I felt. Um, let down and I felt really um, bad that I, d I hadn't known and you know there was these terrible things that happened to people and it wasn't um, anything I could have helped with. Um, if we could turn up WITN 0630, sorry, WITN 0630101 please. And if we can look at the bottom email first, please. Um, this is an email from the communications team at the post office. Um, it's unclear who... Uh, it seems to be within the communications team in 2014, and it says, you may be aware of some media coverage about the post office's horizon system relating to the contents of some confidential documents, and this may prompt questions from the postmasters you speak to. We are challenging the reporting of this matter as it implies we acknowledge there are systemic faults with Horizon. This is absolutely not the case. Um, and looking further down, two or three lines from the bottom, if the postmasters you speak to have specific concerns caused by the coverage, please let us know by email to and then the email address. Scrolling up, we can then see that someone called Julia Marwood, do you know who that is? I knew her from post office. Yeah. Um, what position did she have? Um, I, I can't recall. She was head of something, but I can't recall person, the proper title. And we can see here that she forwards the email saying, Cascade, please <laughs> forward media coverage on post office IT system. Guys, please make sure all your guys are on message with this, as they may well get asked when in branches. It's critically important they maintain the line below and not give any personal opinions or otherwise as to the validity of um, HOL. Um, and we can see that that's then, if we scroll up again, forwarded um, to a number of trainers. Um, were you aware of this email being sent at the time? No, I wasn't, because I was working for the um, network transformation team at that time. Does it surprise you to, to see an email like this going... It, sh it shocks me, actually. Um, and if we could turn up um, WITN 0638010102, please. And if we can go to the bottom of that first page... 
this is in 2015, um, and this is an email following up from the BBC's Panorama programme saying, I wanted to send a short update on the plans by BBC Panorama to broadcast a programme about the post office and its horizon system on Monday. Um, we've spent a great deal of the week dealing with this issue and making our position clear to the BBC at very senior levels. We do expect, however, that the programme will include a number of unsubstantiated allegations. We've decided against being interviewed as part of the programme and have instead issued a robust statement. This was a very carefully considered decision, but the programme wanted us to speak publicly about individual cases and we're not prepared to break the confidentiality commitments we have given about these. Whilst it's difficult to take this position in the face of untrue claims being made in public, we believe it is the right one. And if we scroll up again, and a little bit more, um, we can see that this was then forwarded again to, I think, a wide array of, of trainers. Do you recognise any of the names on that? Uh, some of the names I recognise as being um, trainers, yes. Um, do you find this email shocking? Yeah. And no one was saying at this time, you, you've you got to get your consistent public line correct to you about what you thought about the Horizon system. No, I, th I think, I because I was on a different team then, I wasn't included in any of this. And even, I mean, I would have still been um, in touch with some of these people, but nobody, I didn't have any inkling of um, that at all. And I had no knowledge of it. Um, thank you. Those are all the questions that I have, uh, Mrs Palmer. But, um, Chair, do you have any questions at this time? No, thank you very much. Um, I believe Mr Jacobs, and Mr Jacobs has some questions. Thank you, sir. Um, um, Mrs Palmer, um, good morning. Um, <laughs> good morning. I, I represent 156 sub-postmasters, managers and assistants um, who uh, How and Co Act for. Um, I have some questions for you about what you say in your statement about resolution of disputes. Um, could we turn to uh, page 12 of 15 of your statement, paragraph 31? That's um, WITN 05360100. Right at the bottom there, you say um, that you were never aware of any contact or input by Fujitsu in any disputes. Is that right? Yes, it is. Um, were you aware that Fujitsu held audit data which contained a complete and accurate record of all actions performed by a sub-postmaster, manager or assistant when they were using the Horizon system. Is that something? No, I wasn't aware of that at all. And again, I have to ask you, did you know, and I imagine that your answer is going to be no because you <laughs> answered no to the first question, did you know that the post office had a contractual right to request audit data from Fujitsu to ascertain exactly what keys on the Horizon system uh, had been pressed at any given time? No, I didn't. Um, now, you were a field team leader who led audits, is that right? Yes. Do you think, now, looking back, that is something that you really should have known about? Yeah, and uh, to be honest, that would have probably helped when you were looking for discrepancies as well, if we could have got all that knowledge. And to the best of your knowledge, did the contracts managers with whom you worked know about this? I, I don't think they... Oh, well, I can't say they did or didn't. I wouldn't... I don't know. But you weren't aware? No, I wasn't aware of that. No. Um, you say at paragraph 33 of your statement... This is moving on to page 13 of 15. Perhaps if we could just show that um, so we can see it. Um, you say, as an auditor... It was difficult to identify errors that had occurred in the past as the documentation wasn't always available and the systems didn't go back far enough. Yeah. Um, in light of what we've just been talking about, <laughs> do you now accept there actually was a means by which these investigations could have been Yeah, been I mean, fairly? and when we did um, an audit and you couldn't, or, or you were trying to help find a loss or discrepancy, if the systems didn't go back far enough, we would then refer it back to Chesterfield because, as far as we understood, they could go back further than we could go on site. But apart from that, yeah, we, I didn't know any more. Um, 
you also say at paragraph 33 that you had every faith that the system was working as it should, yep. um, and when errors occurred, it was down to human error. And I think yes. you also said this morning, haven't you, that um, whenever you did audits, because of this belief you had, you were looking for human error or something else. Yes. Um, and you were shocked when you saw the Panorama program. Definitely, yes. Um, was this view that um, when errors occurred, it was down to human error, was that a view that was shared by your colleagues? I can't speak for anybody else, but I think that was ge the general approach, was that the first thing you go and look for is either something that had been input to the system wrong or something they put in the wrong, put um, as a deposit instead of a withdrawal, or there'd be something physical that you could actually see they uh, had been put in by error. Yeah. Now, again, um, paragraph 33, you say that you feel the post office should have been open when they discovered faults. Yeah as it made everyone involved feel absolutely stupid and rotten through no fault of their own. Well, that's what I felt when that Panorama programme came out, because, you know, I've done my best all the time I worked for post office to do the best I could for my postmasters. And, you know, you just feel, like, awful. And we've seen the email that um, Miss Kennedy um, put yeah. up on the screen. Um, in the... the, the post office sent out in relation to the Panorama programme. Uh, are you able to say, and you may not be able to say, but why do you think the post office weren't being open about all of this? I, I really don't understand why not. I think, um, no, I just, I can't understand it. I know that's the size of the business and um, I... One of the very first things we used to cover on the classroom course was the fact that the post office was one of the most trusted brands... And that, you know, that was what we were telling people that were um, buying a business and putting their um, money into it. And that was, you know, they were buying into post office because it was one of the most trusted brands in the country. And what do you think about that now? <laughs> um, I don't make no comment to that, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to ask Mr Hold if I have any further questions. No, I haven't. That's it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Um, is that, is that it? Yes, Chair. Um, well, thank you very much, Mrs. Palmer, for coming to give evidence thank to you. the inquiry and for the straightforward nature of your answers, if I may say so. Thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much. Um, Chair, unfortunately, Mr. Rollison still hasn't received his equipment. We're looking at alternative arrangements, but unfortunately, we won't be able to sit for the rest of the day and hear his evidence. And that, that's confirmed, is it, Ms. Kennedy? There's no point in us waiting for 30 minutes or even an hour just to see what happens. Um, I believe the most we've been told is that he may get it by 6pm. So Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I even allowing for um, the best will in the world, I don't think we, we want to start evidence that late <laughs> on a Friday. Yes. Um, and, Chair, um, the other po point to note is that we aim to publish the timetable for the rest of the Phase 3 hearings uh, by Monday. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Well, um, uh, we're now going to have a, a reasonably substantial break in the hearings, are we not? Um, yes, though the alternative arrangements to hear Mr Rollison's evidence may mean that we might try and do something sooner than, yeah, than the right. break. But yes, other than that, yes. Subject to Mr. Rollison, we're going to have a few weeks um, break in the inquiry. Um, it's not ideal that this is happening, and I'm now not speaking to you, Ms. Kennedy, but generally, but this is a function of um, us having to be accommodated uh, as and when we can at the moment at the um, Dispute Resolution Centre. And I'm reasonably hopeful that over the coming weeks we will find ourselves a permanent place uh, where there will be less uh, uh, possibility of disruption to the hearings as we're going forward. Um, but be that as it may, um, I'm sorry that there will be this um, few weeks break in the hearing of evidence. But no doubt no one will be surprised to hear that Myself and the inquiry team will have lots to do during that period. So I'll see you in a few weeks, everyone. Bye.